I would like to acknowledge the sun, the moon and the stars. I would like to acknowledge the earth, the water, the flora, the fauna and the traditional custodians of this country, Bunjalung country. And this place, the place of the Gujumbara and Minyambal people, it is their land that we are gathered on today. I'd like to offer my gratitude to the elders of the past and acknowledge their struggle. I would like to pay my respects to the present elders and offer my support and encouragement to the elders of the future. I would like to acknowledge that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Eve Jeffrey and I'm an Echo Drudge. I've been asked by Mungo's family, Jenny, Diana, Gail, Gillian and Adrian to direct proceedings with Tex and Reuben adding their paws of approval. <laughs> We'd like to welcome you all to this farewell, whether you are in this room or joining us online. We have people from all over the place and we have a special apology today from the main um, hippie collective who couldn't make it because they're flooded in. I met Mungo through my friendship with Jenny's daughter, Adrienne. Um, I had no idea who Mungo McCallum was. I was just all, I'd just always seen him as this big fairy bloke with a, a beer glass in one hand and several dogs glued to the other. Uh, during those first few occasions, I don't remember him even speaking. It was always just laughter. It wasn't until I started The Echo almost 18 years ago that I got to know him a bit better and curiously the day I started was pretty much the day another Eve, Eve Sinton, finished and often I'd ring him about one bit of Echo business or another and I'd announce myself as Eve or Jenny would hand over the phone and go, it's Eve and he'd start laughing and talking about something and then I'd, I'd do my best to stop him mid-sentence and go, no Mungo, it's not that Eve, it's the other Eve. So it got to the stage where I'd just ring him up and go, hi Mungo, it's Eve, the other Eve. He soon got used to that. About 10 years ago, David Lovejoy held a, an in-service, basically an in-service at his home in Mullumbimby. Uh, and Mungo was there, of course. And as an uneducated writer, I eagerly listened to all the things that he had to say. And I can tell you I, I learnt more about being a journalist in that hour um, than all my other experiences put together, uh, apart from the lessons I learnt across the desk from Michael McDonald's. Between the two of them, uh, there was no need for three years at university. Mind you, there are those who would have a different opinion about that. Since then, I have passed whatever of Mungo that I could onto the various work experience kids that Mullum High send to us. Pinned on a, a board above what is now Aslan Shan's desk is a yellowing typewritten piece of paper and I send each new rookie in, in there to unpin it and type it up and email it back to me in the hope that copying it down a few of the ideas will stick. It also means that I have little reminders to myself sprinkled through my inbox of Mungo. On the piece of paper are Orwell's famous six rules for writing and underneath that are Mungo's four extra four rules. This is as good a time as any to expand your knowledge. Rule one, choose nouns and verbs carefully and avoid overuse of adjectives and adverbs. Never use a word if you are not sure of its exact meaning. When in doubt, use the dictionary. I live by that one. Read what you have written aloud. Often the ear will pick up clumsiness that the eye has missed. Do not start to write unless you are absolutely clear about what you want to say. And I think he was always really good at that, being very clear. After hearing about Mungo's passing, a fellow um, emailed a letter in. Actually, the amount of letters, Aslan can attest to this, the amount of letters we've had into the Echo in the last week have been phenomenal. The letter writer said, Back in the 1980s, Mungo was tickled by the suggestion that he write the occasional column for the weekly free Tasmanian Mail, which I edited. Indeed, so tickled that he graciously accepted our maximum payment of $30. Perhaps the greatest favour he gave us came at a Canberra press conference with national TV cameras rolling live. He framed his question to the then PM Malcolm Fraser with these historic identifying words. Mungo McCallum, Tasmanian male. <laughs> Such a wit. 
and that was from Jan Haswell, who I think is watching from the Philippines today. There are going to be a number of lovely speakers today from different parts of Mungo's life, and for myself, for my own comfort, I'm imagining a realm where the man himself has a beer glass in one hand and a dog or two glued to the other and is watching us and having a bloody good laugh. So let's dive right into the speakers. First of all, I would like to introduce Wall and Victoria Walker, who will talk about Mungo's early life. Thank you very much for having me, and I'm a bit overawed to being asked to speak first, but, there, but I, I should acknowledge the Bundjalung people and the land that we stand on here today. But I want, wanted to speak a, a little bit about Mungo, the things that might have inspired him because he, he, he sort of found his vocation, or it found him, I'm not sure. But it, it probably a good place to start is with the first of his family, a distant uncle that arrived here, whose name was uh, Thomas Muir, and he arrived in Sydney in chains, one of the Scottish martyrs, but he, he, he was sent his vocal support in London for the French Revolution, and not, not a popular cause at the time. And he, he on his memorial at Carlton Hill in Edinburgh, are the words, I, I have devoted myself to the cause of the people. It is a cause, a good cause, it shall ultimately prevail. It shall finally triumph. Anyhow, he was uplifted and taken out of Australia for a worse face, fate than staying here. But those are his words. But Mungo was, I think, probably inspired by the thought of, of Thomas Muir. But he was also intellectually inspired by his family, the McCallums. So Mungo McCallum was the, came here to be head of languages at Sydney University and ended up as the vice chancellor and chancellor of the university. But his whole for three generations before Mungo, they were all intellectuals and very committed to to uh, knowledge. The, the, and Mungo followed in their lines, and so that his intellectual background comes from there. But also, it's important to think of his, the Wentworth connections too in his life. Darcy was sent out here for uh, uh, upsetting the apple cart. He was outing members of the establishment for not paying their gambling debts and that led to him being uh, asked to leave Britain. But Fitz, uh, his son, William Charles, of course, fought against, for, for the independence of the colony, and he uh, uh, took on uh, Earl Bathurst, and the Secretary of State, and the Whigs, uh, sorry, and the Tories, and he then, and uh, criticised the big Commissioner Biggs report and criticised Governor Darling and he, he gradually as it, more and more people came from Britain the convicts became very unpopular and the, and the convicts tainted counted against his family who were all either married to convicts or descended from convicts and he was and his wife stayed in England. He came back and, uh, on occasion, but when she died, his wife Sarah 
felt the criticism of the, uh, uh, for the convict taint so badly because her daughters weren't permitted into the society of Sydney. They were outcasts. So they stayed in Britain and they found hus husbands in Britain. But Sarah never returned. She's buried in Eastbourne. And I think Mungo was, they, was also affected by the, not only the outstanding contributions they'd made, but that they were outcasts as well. Mungo lived in the house with my grandparents. Uh, W.C. Wentworth III and his wife, uh, Florence Griffiths. And uh, Florence Griffiths was from a family that were tea, tea uh, traders. They they held a, a property here on Bunjalung country, an enormous property called Warrawulgan, which I think means bend in the river, and it was some 25,000 head of stock on it, and they had a boiling down works there. Uh, that was found, Griffiths and Fanning Tea Merchants. They didn't live there. They, it was run by a fellow called George Sparks. But for my grandmother, they were the happy memories of her life that she enjoyed immensely, her youth and experience at Warrawulgan. But my grandfather was totally English. He was born in England. He was born in Winborne, in, in Dorset. He went to school, Wellington College, and then to a Gray's Inn in, in, uh, and became a barrister. When he came back to Australia, he, w he had been ostracised for his convict taint at school. They had teased him, they'd given him the name uh, Titch, Little Titch after a comedian called Little Titch, whose name descended from the, the butcher from Wagga who claimed the title of Lord Titchborn. And um, I think my grandfather lived in fear of, of the convict taint and, and he spent his life in the union club, at the races or at the cricket, but he never worked in, in Sydney. But he was... A, a, Mungo probably knew him better than any of uh, the other grandchildren in our family. But in passing, I'll just tell one quick story. I, I was Mungo, uh, the closest cousin to Mungo, in, to, in nearly in age. But I lived in Belleville Hill and he lived in Point Piper. And we would see each other, even that we went to different schools, we would see each other often. I enjoyed my Uncle Mac, Mungo's father. I, I, he took us sailing and down to to Lady Martin's Beach for swimming and all these things. And, uh, and so he was an important formative influence in both our lives. But for Mungo, uh, the story that I'm going to tell, we, we, sailed, we went with Jenny and Victoria to Hamilton Island to pick up a boat from uh, uh, Chute Harbour to sail around the Witch Sundays. And we flew up on the plane, and the air hostess dressed Mungo down. There he was with his scraggy beard, in shorts, with sandals on. And she said, you shouldn't be up here in first class. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was asked to talk a bit about Mungo at university, uh, where I knew him and worked on An Histoire and um, in the theatre, in the productions with him. So I just thought I'd um, uh, start in 1957 when Mungo was 15. He was at Cranbrook um, and he did his leaving certificate, got a sec second class honours. He was eligible for a Commonwealth scholarship um, five A's, second class honours in French. 
Um, but his parents decided that he was too young, too immature to go to university and that he should repeat the leaving. And he uh, later in his life agreed with that. Uh, he went back to Cranbrook in 1958, um, age 16. You probably know his birthday's in December, so uh, I'm say, telling you how old he was that year. And he says about it later that he really enjoyed that year. The pressure was off. He'd passed the leaving. He knew he could get ahead. He played sport. He developed his uh, left-hand spin bowling. He'd never been much of a sporter at school and did debating and chess. And he got a f three first-class honours and two A's. Um, he topped... He was second in New South Wales in maths one and English and fourth in the state overall. And uh, the next year he sailed off to St Andrews College uh, and Sydney University, which was about the only <coughs> university around at the time. His father had been at Andrews and his father, as mine had, and they had both uh, uh, directed the Andrews re reviews and both worked on Onisoir. And uh, he, I, I remember when I went to university, I didn't know what you did there, so I knew what my father had done and I decided that's what I'd do. Uh, he was... Um, I met Mungo in the Onisoir office, which was in the Mungo McCallum building, two rather dingy rooms. And I... Uh, he was standing there with his foot on the desk. He had this habit of standing with his foot on the desk. And I was um, quite amazed, his voice, the way he stood and this rather insouciant manner was so like my father. They were both been to Cranbrook and I found that absolutely uncanny. My father had died a couple of years before and I, um, you know, I warmed to him absolutely. A lot of people were a bit... Uh, nervous about Mungo, particularly the males. You know, he was so intelligent, so upfront, intelligent, clever, witty, brilliant capacity to undercut. You know all of that. But he was a lot sharper in those days, and um, and uh, I didn't. It didn't really bother me. So uh, I thought I'd talk a bit first about um, Onisoir. This is where he honed his his writing skills. I was going to talk about some of the people there, but I'm not going to waste your time. But just to say that the university in those days was a completely different creature from a university today. When Mungo began, the Vice-Chancellor, Sir Charles Bigot and Blackburn, had been there uh, since 1941, and he would continue for another five years after Mungo left. The Chancellor, that the he was the Chancellor, the Vice-Chancellor, Stephen Roberts, had been there for I think about 10 years and would be another 10. Uh, it was a small, a much smaller campus and it's fascinating that in the, the members of staff uh, were involved in university theatre. Uh, they took an interest in it. Um, the wives, uh, Stephen Roberts' wife was involved in players. The professor of psychiatry's wife uh, very famously uh, took a great leading role in, in the theatre. Onisoir was a slightly different beast from the, the um, drama societies. A lot of the people on Oni um, knew they were going to be journalists. They wrote passionately. The paper, it was a newspaper. It looked like a newspaper. You can look it up on the web. Uh, it dealt with international news, national news um, and university news. Uh, and it also was, had lots of fun. Uh, I remember Dottie Hodnot had a weekly cartoon uh, and they had wonderful stories, like for one whole year, the bedouins of the intellectuals in the university were the engineers. The, 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 the literate, people interested in literature were a different world. And they very uh, nuttily described engineers as people who either dug holes or filled them in. <laughs> and so for every week, we would have a report on the holes, the status of the holes around the university. <laughs> It was a big building period, but these were very serious and the, the reporters would cover them so we knew what the engineers were up to and uh, the state of, of the holes. So um, they didn't have bylines as such in there. You, you don't actually look for Mungo's articles, but uh, he got a reputation as being the person to call on uh, when the, the paper was being prepared to go up towards the Anglican press 
um, that printed it because he could always quickly fill a hole. He could write a good story to a certain size and off it would go. So he was absolutely indispensable around about the time that it was going off to press. It was also very subject to something we don't know a lot about now, which is um, uh, intervention. Uh, uh, if people considered that something that was written was improper, and so there, there was a constant stream of uh, problems where uh, articles were deemed to be uh, quite improper. But in in, in the theatre side, it was even worse uh, that because naturally everybody would have a go and the police, the vice squad would be there on the first, sometimes every night to make sure that, that the, the, the production didn't use a rude word or I remember the first play that I worked on in, um, in the Drama Society was while I was still at school, my sister was at university and they needed people backstage and it was Ubu Hua of Jari and my job was to put Chester's um, dressed Chester, I was his dresser, and put his bare, bare head on because he went on stage as a bear. But the, uh, the the fascinating thing about it was the opening word was shit, and so the vice squad came in, couldn't possibly use that word. So they changed it to merde, to the French. <laughs> <laughs> but the vice squad was there every night to make sure they didn't translate it back. So... Um, Mungo started working in the theatre in St Andrews. I have to tell you, um, I, I wrote it down, I counted them all. There were uh, a huge number of drama societies they, in the University at the time, three, six, seven, there were about 20. So departments would put on plays, the French department, the German department, the classic society, different students groups, the, the Jewish students, all the colleges... There were two major drama societies, Suds, a very old one that started in 1880, and it actually taught and uh, developed the main acting fraternity in the professional theatres in Sydney. Um, and then there was a reaction to that. They were, in 1949, they set up Sydney University Players, which wasn't as constrained by tradition. And Mungo gravitated to the Players, but he started in the uh, St Andrews College Drama Society, which put on a review every year. But they also did quite a lot of experimental theatre. So in 1959, he'd barely arrived in the place, and he stage managed a production of a very surreal comedy by the Czech Karol Kapek called Insect World, and he played Mr Cricket. He was an insect as well as a stage manager. And the director was Ken Haller. Ken Haller was in Andrews with Mungo, and Mungo worked on a lot of his plays. So I just thought I'd just, for interest, mention some of these different things he did. Um, but he did everything else as well. These are the ones that had his name on them, but he also worked backstage, wrote reviews, built sets. He was so involved. And um, he says in The Man Who Laughs, he talked about his going to university. During orientation week, I enthusiastically joined every society which would have me as a member up to or perhaps down to the speleological group. But once I discovered the dramatic societies and the university newspaper on Iswar, my purpose in life became clear. As my passions increased, so my studies declined. In first year, I managed high distinctions. In, second year, second, in, in my second, distinctions. And in my third, I was tossed out of the English honours class and barely held my place in pure mathematics. In my honours year, I scraped a pitiful third. So um, I, I had long since abandoned such peripheral pursuits as lectures and tutorials. <laughs> and I remember being in a tutorial where um, the, the tutor, who was a reasonably young person, was so elated. He, he had given a lecture that morning and he said, Mungo McCallum came to my lecture. And, and uh, you know, this was a big event and Mungo was absolutely famous for never taking a note. He, if he, even if he went to a lecture, he never took a note. He'd just sit there. But this was this fellow was going to be crying about this for weeks if Mungo had attended his lecture. Um, it, the second play he worked on was for, for Sydney University Players, and this is an interesting historic one. It's called Dead Man Walking, and it was Robert Hughes' only play. Um, Robert Hughes in those days was very famous for his influences in his painting and his poetry, the lot. He wasn't a man that worried about influences. Um, 
but it was based very much on Orwell and Auden. And it had two main characters, the noble prisoner and the devious interrogator. And they were Mungo and John Bell. And that was John Bell's first play at the university. So it's quite a famous play. Oh, well, it should be. Um, so the following year, he worked with Ken Haller on Lysistrata by uh, Aristophanes, a proper classical play, and there were a lot of those very classical plays all the way through this period. Um, and uh, Mungo worked backstage. He, um, uh, I think it's that one that he he was in. Cha- he was doing the, the pyrotechnics, and I think one of the, Hyman it was came on stage and was actually blown up onto the stage. He had overdone the, the, um, the explosives that were to blow up the, um, the, the, the... so she could emerge through the floor. So that was a bit scary, and I think that happened again later, and someone absolutely refused to ever come out of the floor while Mungo was doing the pyrotechnics. Um, he then really moved into uh, reviews... They're much more interesting than a script because he was writing a lot of the scripts and they were about current affairs, they were about current issues, which is the mango that we know, the writing that we know. And the first of those was um, Leo Schofield directed and I, I haven't told you where all these are, but they were in all these church halls all over town. This one was in the St Joseph's Church Hall in Camperdown called Nibs and Shepherds. Mungo wrote and he performed. And then he did another play with... Um, with uh, Schofield, well, this was the massive explosion that tried the Fairy Queen, which was a huge project, which what people said couldn't be done. It was that big, and then with Ken Haller, he did a play of E. Cummings. I don't know if you know E. Cummings, uh, the man who didn't use capitals or punctuation, a very interesting, brilliant uh, poet. But he wrote a play that had a cast of 197 people and 20 scene changes. And Ken Haller took it on with a cast of 24. Now, Mungo was in that play, but he was also um, uh, assisting, you know, with the production. But he, re- he said later that Ken had slept in his room at Andrews for two days. He was so exhausted at the end of it. It was such an incredible venture, which he either, according to the critics, either came off or did, didn't come off at all. Now, I, I, this period is known as the, the great uh, renaissance of, or the beginning of um, theatre in, in Australia, real Australian theatre. And it was extremely energetic and... Um, uh, there were 93 plays put on by the students in the period that Mungo was at university, 93. Uh, this is plays and reviews and musicals by that huge group of different bits and pieces, of French department, Jewish students, whatever. They, there was always something going on um, and opportunity to be involved. Uh, in Mungo's... Um, La- second last year, he uh, he did the orientation review himself. He directed that and wrote most of it. Uh, it wrote it with a uh, director with Ken Haller. And uh, in the following year, they did he did the orientation week review, which is for all the new students coming in, and he he did, he directed that solely himself. Uh, he um, that was the year that I started at university. And uh, that I met him, and that I and I worked on v- uh, very few things with him, but he was always around. He was there in the theatre. By then, we had the Union Theatre, so the Union Theatre, though it's now a lecture theatre, was con- um, part of the uh, the whole scene for uh, performing plays. Uh, it was a great sort of event. There were lot, lots of people involved. I only worked backstage. I never worked on... I was never in front of house. I think I was 16 uh, that year I arrived, um, far too nervous to volunteer. But it was, it was such a great experience. The Union Theatre was a marvel for, for everybody. Uh, I'd put on Chester's hat down at St Barnabas down in Broadway. But here they had um, dressing rooms. Uh, I was a dresser uh, very often. We had one on Saturday. We had a matinee and a performance, so we had two performances on Saturday. It was usually only just for a week, and we all had a meal. And John Hodnott, who was 
uh, pretty much stage managed most of these things. I uh, used to organise Chinese food to come on stage for us. So there was this extraordinary great um, tr trays of bright red sweet and sour and you this, uh, the theatre for the first time had intercom for the stage managers so you could hear this terrible burping noises and uh, as, as the production went on after the Chinese meal. Anyway, Mungo left uh, Australia by ship in 1963 for Europe. Uh, he had a mini minor and uh, that he's, uh, he bought with money from his grand. And he took two friends, David Spode and Mike Newman, three very tall Australian men in this little tiny mini minor, which they landed in Singapore and drove across India and through Afghanistan uh, together. I think it stretched to friendship at some, <laughs> at some point. But um, Mungo, as you probably all know, went to Hydra to stay with uh, George Johnson and Charmaine Cliff, who were friends of his parents. And he um, married Sue there and headed to London. Most of that big crowd of people who were involved in, um, in the theatre in, in Sydney University did go to England. Some of them never came back. Some of them came back a long time later, a bit burnt out. Some of them are still there, but most of them have passed by now. But Mungo only stayed two years. Um, but I... Uh, and he then directed two more reviews when he came back. But I wanted to finish with a story that you might have heard. I was working at the Royal Court, Clive James and Ken Haller, we all worked there. You got about seven pounds a week. I was running the theatre upstairs in the Royal Court. Um, I actually rang Chester and asked him to help with the Japanese translation. We sort of stuck together a bit. But Mungo had a family by then, so he had a real job. And he was working in advertising in London. And uh, among his clients, the clients of the agency, was, uh, were Australian products. So he had to develop an ad for Ardmona pears, uh, to sell Ardmona pears. I can see some of you have heard the story. And he came up, this is where he used his theatrical interest in the job. He decided that they would have a kangaroo coming on a surfboard from Australia carrying a can of Ardmona pears. So they went down to this very rocky beach in the south of England. Uh, the poor fellow who had to ride the surfboard with the pears kept falling off, to, much to the irritation of the photographer. So Mungo came up with the brilliant idea of the, for them to get their shot before dark that he nailed the feet of the kangaroo to the ball. And I leave it to your imagination <laughs> to decide what happened, but it was pretty hilarious and another wonderful story. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Wall and Victoria. It's always enlightening to find out what's happened in people's past if you don't know their history. Uh, we're going to hear from someone else now. We're going to hear from Kerry O'Brien, who is going to speak about uh, Mungo's journalistic legacy. Thank you, Kerry. I'd also like to acknowledge the, the people whose lands we're on, um, elders past, present and emerging. In recent years, as illness was piled on illness, surgery on surgery, chemotherapy on chemotherapy, we all knew Mungo's exit from the stage on which he shone for so long was just a matter of time. It's a testament to his extraordinary powers of endurance and downright stubbornness and Jenny's grounded good sense that he didn't go sooner. He had too many columns to write, too much time to make up with family. So we've had all the time in the world to prepare for this, and yet already we miss him mightily. So bright the intelligence, so sharp the wit, so pungent the tongue, so warm and generous the heart. Mid last year I spent two weeks polishing a 3,000 word profile on Mungo for the monthly magazine which now reads like an obituary. In fact, it read like it at the time, because we all knew that he was on borrowed time. But I was determined to write it before he went. But in the process, of course, it has rendered impossible for me to speak today without self-plagiarising to some degree, so forgive me if some of this sounds familiar. And, and, and in the first, let me, let me add to the picture 
of Mungo's ancestors, the first chapter of his memoir is headed, My family used to run the place, but all I got was their clapped out jeans. <laughs> and Gough Whitlam put it differently, once describing Mungo as a tall bearded descendant of lunatic aristocrats. <laughs> Now, at Sydney Uni, I, I think we should, we should acknowledge on the way through, and that was a wonderful kind of early picture of the sort of stuff that Mungo was getting up to. And he was one of the more notable in an extraordinary generation of brilliant young Australians who were on the verge of shaking their country uh, out of its post-war social straitjacket, thin-lipped morality, suffocating chauvinism and narrow bigotry. Jermaine Greer, Clive James, Les Murray, John Bell, Bob Ellis, Richard Walsh, Mark, Martin Sharp, Bruce Beresford, Robert Hughes and a bevy of others. And Richard later observed that Mungo's brilliance as a writer, his flamboyant character and his pedigree soon established him as one of the most colourful personalities of his time. Now that is quite a statement when you look at those names. And that description continued to apply when he joined the Australian newspaper in 1965 less than two years after Rupert Murdoch launched it as the country's first national newspaper. It continued to apply when he joined the Australian's political bureau in Canberra. The bureau chief was the great Alan Ramsey, who also died just in the last two weeks, who also took no prisoners amongst the more pompous or hypocritical members of the political class. And the other correspondents were George Negus, who tried hard but failed to come here today, they were actually flooded in, in Ballingen. There was also David Solomon, Ken Randall and Paul Kelly in that bureau. Throughout this period, Mungo was also moonlighting as the anonymous political correspondent for Oz magazine, where his colourful and often scurrilous coverage perfectly fitted the magazine's determination to shock and challenge. By this time, his mainstream proprietor, Rupert Murdoch, who was in the process of transitioning politically from vaguely left to pronounced right, had taken to stamping into the Sydney office of Mungo's editor, Adrian Deemer, shouting that he had not started the paper as a refuge for soft bearded lefties with suede shoes. <laughs> so within a year or so of joining the Australian's Canberra Bureau, Mungo left the dirty digger for the ferret, accepting Richard Walsh's offer to join the new irreverent national weekly Nation Review bankrolled by the young eccentric Australian uh, transport mogul Gordon Barton. This was probably the most important move of Mungo's career because Nation Review gave him the perfect platform, the freedom to display his wares without the more conservative cultural and editorial strictures that bound virtually every other political writer of the time. This was blazing new ground. Let me give you an example. Mungo's description of the opening parliamentary session of the Whitlam government in early 1973 after they'd been in the wilderness for 23 years, where the Governor-General had to read without change the new government's proposed policy agenda as if it was his own. The Governor-General in this instance, Sir Paul Haslick, had previously been one of Gough Whitlam's most acrimonious opponents in the Parliament. Mungo observed that Haslick, quote, went home presumably to wash his mouth out with sulfuric acid <laughs> before coming back for the evening piss-up. <laughs> now, you can imagine that this, that this contrasted quite interestingly with the style of the very staid Sydney Morning Herald at the time, and of course, Mungo went on to describe the aftermath of the actual piss-up, which was not a pretty sight. <laughs> Over the next few years, Mungo became a walking oracle on the inspiration and madness of the Whitlam era. On the brilliant but erratic reformist Attorney General Mungo, uh, Lionel Murphy, Mungo later wrote, when focused, Murphy was formidable, unstoppable, but much of his life was spent in the splendid phrase of humorist Stephen Laycock, riding madly off in all directions. Of Goff himself, Mungo described the great man's irrational irritation with parliamentary comrades who might have been described as vertically challenged, like... Labor's small but perfectly formed medico from Adelaide, as Mungo put it, Dr Richie Gunn, the member for Kingston. Whitlam regularly stomped on Gunn in caucus meetings, said Mungo, and was therefore both surprised and infuriated when he was shown one of the good doctor's election pamphlets in which it was stated, quote, Dr Gunn has been frequently praised by Gough Whitlam for the depth and breadth of his knowledge. <laughs> Gough called Gunn in at once. I've never said any such thing, he insisted loudly. 
Oh, yes, you have, responded Gunn. You have often called me a little fucking Noel. <laughs> for once, said Mungo, the leader was lost for words. <laughs> in the old Parliament House in the 70s, outwardly graceful but inwardly ramshackle, Mungo sometimes shared his small gallery space with the likes of Alan Ramsey, who had by then left the Australian in rather spectacular fashion and who we farewelled in Canberra, as I said, 10 days ago, Richard Carlton, who died 14 years ago, and Ken Randall, who's still going. He wore a path between King's Hall, where so much of the business was conducted, the actual press gallery above the Speaker's chair, the non-members bar, the lobby restaurant in the Rose Garden or near the Rose Garden, EJ's uh, restaurant at Kingston, and the National Press Club. He once wrote in Nation Review that if King's Hall was the building's heart, the chambers its lungs, and lobbies its veins and arteries, then the non-members bar was its liver. <laughs> it opened at 11 each morning, and Mungo was often one of the first there. Lunch at the lobby might follow, then back to the non-members after question time, then possibly EJ's for dinner, and a few beers back at the non-members later that evening to round out the day as well lubricated politicians whispered their leaks or just gossiped. Now, Mungo would start on this daily journey with others. Some of them might have lasted the distance with him, some of them dropped by the wayside. But Mungo's, Mungo's um, constitution uh, was famous. Uh, but as Peter Manning, a subsequent editor at Nation Review, has recalled, sober or not, Mungo's summaries of the week in Canberra sang clear and uh, clean and clear-sighted. Not just funny, not just irreverent, but right on the money, with a clarity and honesty that cut through the bullshit and called it as it was. John Dawkins, who arrived in Canberra as a young backbencher from Perth in 1974 and served subsequently as a senior minister in the Hawke and Keating cabinets, and who, like many others, is watching the Echoes live stream around Australia from his home in South Australia, remembers the Mungo of those days as an essential part of his novitiate. My initial political education, he said, was greatly enhanced by being part of Mungo's audience in the non-members bar, populated as it was by pollies from all sides, staffers and journos. The wine, or avgas, wasn't up to much, but the conversation was. If there was one issue that Mungo wore on his sleeve and in his columns over the decades, it was Indigenous affairs, from university to parliament to Brunswick heads. Few if any, non-Indigenous journalists would have understood the malevolent cancer of racism that has festered within the heart of this nation and the nobility of those few like Goff and even Mungo's own conservative Uncle Bill Wentworth and later Paul Keating, who fought it head on and that still sits there today, still surviving the weasel words, still waiting to be excised. When we consider what a well-known and well-loved force of political journalism Mungo became across Australia in the 70s and 80s. It's interesting to contemplate that he spent these last three decades covering national politics from Byron Bay. Yet, as Tony Wright so eloquently observed in his Herald piece last week, Mungo McCallum remained the most memorable byline in Australian journalism. That says such a great deal about the depth and long-lasting nature of his impact. Mungo stared fate in the eye and dared it to do its worst. I can clearly remember him on one of the many otherwise forgettable late-night shows on commercial television in the 70s or 80s. Mungo, Mungo would go anywhere to offer some commentary, and le leaving a trail of, of, of belly laughs and outrage in his wake. But I can remember him in those shows. There was the one particular show where I think he appeared more than once uh, trying to bait John Singleton who was an occasional brawler, brawler of fiery temperament in those days. And, and Mungo would, uh, would throw the bait out with that big taunting smile of his, uh, but never, never suffered the impact of some of Singleton's um, other bet noirs. And when 10 years ago Mungo filled in for Mike Carlton on his Sydney Morning Herald column, he just went that little bit too far and wrote of that other great force of nature, Blanche Del Puget, that her latest facelift appears to be stuck between floors. <laughs> now, 
Now, I'm sure Mungo would have made the same observation, if it was accurate, of, of either gender, of any gender. Mungo obviously wasn't expecting to meet Blanche in the green room at the Bar and Writers Festival <laughs> just a few weeks later, with the words still very fresh in her mind, at least. And just to complete the circle, Mike Carlton himself was there that day and wrote a postscript in his next column. Blanche hurled herself at Mungo like a cruise missile, Carlton wrote. With a loud cry of, you horrible, horrible man, she began to tear out his beard by the fistful. The sage, bellowing in surprise and pain, somehow wrenched himself free. With a superhuman effort, he frog-marched his assailant to the tent door, then subsided in a limp heap. Even hardened newsmen were shocked. It was hugely enjoyable. <laughs> As we know, Mungo lived a rich life up here in the Northern Rivers for more than three decades, nurturing family bonds, walking his beloved dogs on various beaches, making countless new friends and serving his community through the pages of the Echo and his driving influence on the Bar and Writers Festival, also hosting with Jenny his annual St Mungo's Day, and I'm sure others will talk about those things. Others will say much more on that huge chapter in his life, but it's a chapter he acknowledged he owed to Jenny. Without her, he said, his life would have been much shorter. When I agreed to write uh, last year's profile for Nick Wyke, editor of the Monthly, it was obviously impractical to talk with Mungo face to face sentence by sentence with the aid of his stoma and those painfully shallow breaths, the exercise would have simply been too cruelly limiting. So we exchanged questions and answers by email. I'm going to end with Mungo's own words from those conversations on life and love and death in Brunswick. Quotes. The eminent scientist J.B.S. Haldane wrote a brilliant mock heroic poem called Cancer's a Funny Thing. Mungo wrote in one email exchange, I don't find it all that funny, but given 35 years of dedicated smoking, I really can't complain. People say I'm brave, but I'm not. I will claim to be stoic and as productive and cheerful as I can be under the circumstances, but the constant dependency is the worst. Jenny has, of course, been wonderful, but I feel really guilty about making her into a virtual full-time carer but I'm not allowed to drive, can only walk about 100 metres with a stick and eat much of my food through a tube from a hole in my stomach. Brackets. Haldane mentions it. Quote, And now I am like two-faced like two Janus, the only man who can see his own anus. <laughs> These are things to live for, he said, but I'm genuinely not worried about dying. I'm an atheist, which is actually something of an advantage. Since my school days, I've regarded religion as superfluous. Occam's razor warns against multiplying entities unnecessarily, which means there is already an inadequate, that, uh, uh, that if there is already an inadequate explanation, don't make another one up instead. Religion is mainly about creation, now comprehensively covered by science, and morals varying from creed to creed, which and usually derive more from common sense and culture than blind obedience. Philosophers all tell you that if you do good for hope of reward or fear of punishment, you are not doing good at all. I do believe there are some absolutes. Cruelty and racism are always and everywhere wrong. Being sure of what is right is more complicated. I usually fall back on the old formula of trying to leave the place a bit better. He certainly has. That misogynist grump and compulsive correspondent, Paul, who never met Jesus but claimed to have channelled him in the throes of an epileptic fit, did at least produce a useless set of a useful set of triplets. I find faith the least appealing. Her sister's hope and charity are far more attractive. And for all his target practice through those myriads of words over fifty five years, practically all of it deserved, that is how Mungo lived his life, with hope and charity and large lumps, lumps of love and kindness. He called his memoir Mungo, The Man Who Laughs, borrowing from a Bertolt Brecht poem on posterity. He who laughs has not yet heard the terrible tidings. It speaks volumes for the durability of the human spirit, certainly his. Thank you, Kerry, that was awesome. Um, you had me at soft-bearded lefty with suede shoes. That was really good. 
Okay, our next speaker is not actually in the room. Um, we're going to be hearing from um, Anthony Albanese, who has recorded a message. Yes, I think he's going to be here. I won't be in the way when this happens. Um, he's uh, recorded a message and he sent it up yesterday, I think, and we're going to have a listen to that now. Thanks, Ewan. When you, when you think, think old, old school, school, you think, you think, think of Mungo Mungo McCallum. McCallum. Mungo was perhaps, was perhaps the greatest, the greatest political, political skeptic of, of our time. time. He was, was a great, great satirist, satirist of Australian, Australian politics, a master at deflating egos, egos and, calling and calling out pomposity in, in such, such an Australian, Australian way. way. But Mungo, politics, politics was, was a serious, serious business, business, but it, but was, it was also, also something, something to be savoured and, and enjoyed. enjoyed. You, could you could feel, feel that when you heard his raucous laugh. laugh which thundered loudest when he was confronted with political absurdity, and he often found politics quite absurd. But Mungo was also a very serious man. As much as he enjoyed calling out fools, he also recognised great policy and positive outcomes that it could have on the lives of Australians. Mungo worked, worked for many years in many publications, publications including the Australian, Australian, the Sydney Morning Herald and the Nation Review. Review. His heyday was the period from the lead up to the, the 1972 election, election until, until the move to the, to the new Parliament, Parliament House. House. The, the Whitlam, Whitlam era and Goff's ambitious agenda seemed to capture Mungo's personality and perspective. perspective. It was, was a time, a time of excitement. excitement. A time, time of, of ideas, ideas and, and a time, time of momentous of political, political events. events. Mungo, Mungo seemed to understand, understand the, the sense, sense of anticipation that, that was there after, after 23, 23 long years of conservative, conservative rule. rule. Australians, Australians looked at the decaying liberal administration, administration and, and sense that, that change was coming. coming. And Mungo's writing seemed, seemed to embody that, that sense of change defined, defined that era. era. The sacking of the Whitman government, government, of course, changed, changed everything for the nation. The dismissal, the dismissal fractured, fractured stability in politics and broke the, the trust that had been there between the political, political parties. parties. Later, Later, I had the great, great privilege of briefly entering uh, Mungo's world when I became, became a staffer for Tom, Tom Uren, Uren in, in Old Parliament, Parliament House. House. This, this was, was a time where people gathered, ministers, backbenchers, staffers, and journalists, with, with everything off the record, record uh, without, without mobile, mobile cameras, cameras capturing the events, events under, under that, that grand old tree outside, outside uh, the, the bar in the, in the middle, middle of Parliament, Parliament House. House. Mungo was, was a legend of the, of the press gallery, gallery known, known and respected by politicians and other journalists for his wit and, and his fearlessness. But they, but they also knew that he was a very fair journalist. journalist. He, he was happy, happy to pummel both, both sides of politics if he thought they got, they got it wrong. wrong. It, it seems somehow fitting that Mungo didn't, didn't make the move up the hill to the current Parliament House, instead moving to northern New South Wales and, and his, his beloved, beloved Byron Bay community. community. Uh, uh, there, there, of course, course he continued to comment on both local, local events but also national, national politics, politics through the Byron Shire Echo and, and with, with uh, other engagement, engagement in, in everything from writers' festivals, festivals uh, uh, to, to engaging with people like me when we dropped by uh, the far north coast of New South Wales. His journalism, I think, was probably better suited to the old place. Uh, this was a time where reporters uh, literally uh, shared desks and worked so closely with that personal interactions because Mungo was indeed someone who enjoyed that personal uh, activity and engagement uh, with people. Many good journalists aspire to sketch writing and political analysis. Many of those aspirants are good writers, but don't quite understand the mysteries of politics. That's where Mungo had a tremendous advantage. He was not only a great writer with a fantastic turn of phrase, he also understood politics. 
many people would re wouldn't have uh, been able to read uh, his writings in the, the Echo, but they would have heard him on the ABC or making other commentary verbally, always sharp, always cutting to the chase of what the political debate of the day was about. Mungo was interested in people and the way that decisions affected people in their everyday lives. He was a brilliant man who could not only tell you what was happening in the corridors of power, but also give you a laugh along the way. There have been so many tributes since Mungo's passing. Paul Bongiorno described him as a giant of the craft. My friend Karen Middleton, the journalist, said he was the last true larrikin. He will indeed be sadly missed. So on behalf of the Australian Labor Party, I pay tribute to Mungo McCallum and I honour his contribution to our national life. I offer my sincere condolences to his partner, Jenny, to his family and to his many, many, many friends and colleagues who will all miss him, but all have fond memories of his contribution and the way that he touched their life, many of whom, of course, he had never met. Val Mungo McCallum. That was really lovely. I really liked that when I saw it yesterday. I thought it was very refreshing. On your elbow. Um, I imagine, I think it was three, three and a half weeks ago when we got a, an email from Mungo saying, you know, this is my last piece. I'm not going to be writing anymore. And uh, though we all miss that, I suspect there are a lot of people in Canberra who breathed a little bittersweet sigh of relief <laughs> that they were no longer going to be in the firing line. Uh, next, I have the absolute pleasure of introducing my sister from another mister. Delta K is going to speak about um, Mungo's passionate advocacy of reconciliation. Thank you, Jenny, for having the Iraqi people come and honour such a huge personality in our community and to speak, to speak plain without no um, fancy words he was deadly deadly is someone great in, in that slang word of ours he was part of our community who would be always there for Aboriginal rights no pomp no ceremony he was just always there and talking to Jenny about, um, I suppose, when he first met our mob was at the passing of a very special elder. My grandparents had 13 children born and raised on Tallow Creek. And the last four, as many of you would know, lodged our native title claim in 1994. And this was lodged by four women the K sisters, Lorna, Linda, Dulcie and Yvonne. And the youngest of the four sisters, Annie Yvonne Graham, she lived at Brunswick Heads and she was told by the doctors that um, she only had weeks to live. So Annie Eve wasted no time and when she saw Eddie Marbo, win his native title rights in 1993. She said, if he can do it, we can do it too. Little did she know on the huge journey that native title would take them on. Politics is an ugly thing. Native title is an ugly thing and it made our old people very sick. Sadly, Annie Eve, she passed away before the historical signing of our Iliwa, our Indigenous Land Use Agreement in 2001. But Mungo attended Aunty Eve's funeral at Brunswick Heads in that tiny little church. And my mum, Linda, who is very well known for swooning at funerals, was assisted by Mungo with Rescue Remedy. Everyone in the Byron Shire has rescue remedy. 
thank you, Mungo. So from this, the start of this huge story of my people proving their descent and connection on country here, we've always had Mungo there supporting us in the background. And for, I suppose, one of the younger people of the Oracle people, I've always seen him in the background. I've always been in awe of him. And I suppose I got to know Jenny in her fabulous coat. And they've always been kind and always been supportive. And for you to be there right there at the end for our consent determination on the banks of the Brunswick River to finally finish off our native title journey that was lodged in 1994 and completed in 1919. We honour, we respect you and Mungo and your family. Thank you, it's such a joy to have you in our community and may he be a shining beacon for all those who come here and call this place home. Gary Ma, thank you. I remember that day last year in Brunswick Heads, it was something pretty special. And um, actually it was a bit of a day like this. It was overcast and cold and um, all the Oracle mob and a lot of the Bundjalung people were on the banks of the Bruns and they had one of those big, you know, white marquees and the judge stood up the front and everybody was waiting for those words, which was basically an acknowledgement that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land, but not quite in that language. Um, Mungo was there in his little trolley. He couldn't, he couldn't get close enough to the front. He was like backing it in and it was like... Doo, 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 doo. He just wanted to be right up there in front because he wanted to be so much part of that. And I think you'll see in the slideshow after, there's a lovely portrait of Jenny and Mungo and, and Delta there. And it was such a... You know, we're all crying, aren't we? Look at us. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It was such... An amazing, amazing day, and yes, I don't think any of us will ever forget it. Uh, we have more speakers. Next, I would like to invite uh, Russell Eldridge, who will speak about Mungo's association with the Byron Writers Festival. Thank you, Russell. First, I'd like to acknowledge Jenny, a woman of great love and strength and the daughters, Diana and Gail, Adrian and Gillian. I first encountered Mungo's writing more than 40 years ago when moonlighting as a casual sub-editor in Sydney. I was a new immigrant from South Africa and I was gobsmacked at this writing. Why wasn't he in jail? <laughs> this avenging angel with a bloodied pen, smiting hypocrites, scoundrels and Tories which to Mungo were all one and the same. How did he get away with it? I found out after he and Jenny had left Canberra and I interviewed him on the veranda at Ocean Shores. The lesson was, for anyone debating Mungo on politics, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. <laughs> As we all know, he was preternaturally informed and he would not back down to assuage a deflated ego or shattered argument. And if the gods took pity and allowed you a point in the discussion, he'd smile gracefully and incline that big shaggy head, leaving it up to you to decide whether you'd scored a hit or you just didn't get it. <laughs> it was the same with the glorious cryptic crosswords. If you didn't know that Hawk was a stand-in for Bob, you'd better switch to the simple. <laughs> Mungo was a loyal supporter of the Byron Writers Festival from its inception as a panellist and moderator, and his reach extended from the audience too, a Fidel Castro-like figure at the back of the tent, reaching for the public microphone to remind the panellists of the error of their ways. <laughs> One memorable evening at a festival event at the Byron Community Centre, Jermaine Greer was promoting her book Shakespeare's Wife, when a hand went up in the audience, Jermaine squinted into the dark. Mango, 
she exclaimed. They told me you were dead. <laughs> Much exaggerated, he replied, then proceeded to deliver a quick refresher on Elizabethan history. Germain stared open-mouthed. The gilded child doth lecture in my sight, she muttered. Undeterred, Mungo completed his dissertation and allowed Germain to continue. I'm pleased to say that the Bayern Writers' Festival has decided to honour Mungo with a new political discussion panel in his name. What struck me on getting to know Mungo, though, was the personal humility, kindness and generosity of this formidable keyboard warrior. He was a sort of Chaucerian gentle knight, but one on a remorseless quest to slay those who would place private greed over the public good. I also came to learn of his deep love of Australia, its institutions and its people, with a particular respect for Indigenous Australians. And that passion extended to the natural world in his travels with Jenny, or in the simple pleasure of returning from the Mullumbimby Orchid Show with a new specimen. And who could forget the dreamy summer afternoons on St Mungo's Day when our man would take the microphone and test the vocal limits of St. James Infirmary, <laughs> while Lloyd and his combo played on, a man in full. And Neville Rand misread masculinity when he said, Belmain boys don't cry. A strong man does cry, and I've seen Mungo shed a tear over a beloved dog or a dear friend. Mungo's passions and acuity did not diminish as his health declined. In the early days after the loss of his voice, Mungo would scribble thoughts and reposts on a ready-to-hand notebook. But the comments became more laconic. His ideas distilled to shorthand, until much of the world and its shenanigans could be expressed in just three gestures. A Caesar-like thumbs up, or down, or a wavering hand for nuance. But the smile, the graciousness, and the keen eye never wavered. A brilliant, forceful, kind man, a comrade. We miss you, old friend, but we're better for knowing you. And the ripples of your life will expand for many years to come. Thank you, Russell. Uh, so next I'd like to ask um, Lynn Ramsey, who would like to share some memories of Mungo. Okay, thank Thanks, you. Lynn. Hello, everyone. I first met Mungo and Jenny at a Cranbrook reunion in Eltham in 1988. Who would have thought? It was a reunion disguised as a fundraiser, which really pissed Paul and Mungo off. And we became friends. At our table, at the table that I was at, was the youngest graduate who was only 18 and a man in his 80s who graduated many years ago from Queensland who was put on a train to go to Cranbrook, the old boys' school. And I said to him, is it true about the ditty? Was it around in those days? And he went, what? Tilly Winks, young man, get a woman if you can. If you can't get a woman, get a Cranbrook man. The boys stood up for us. Scott boys stood up for us in the bus. <laughs> Jenny and I got our Cranbrook men. <laughs> and they weren't easy. <laughs> there were times where Jenny and I were frustrated and say, did they breathe it in them down there? They were so similar. Their arrogance, their sense of self-importance, their rudeness, their demands on us. Both of us didn't drink, so we get to drive them. The effort that her and I had to put in to getting those two men into any car at the end of a boozy Sunday was extraordinary. And we'd throw our arms around each other in frustration going, we've done it. Yes, we made it. You may see in the photos a picture of Paul, my husband of 34 years, and Mungo in hospital in tweed heads. We went to visit him. Paul insisted in wearing the Cranbrook tie along with a floral suit. Yes, I said to him once when I was in Brisbane, you should have seen this hideous suit in Lowe's. 
he had it back from court in our house that very day. I'm wearing this in San Francisco when I give that paper at the conference. I went, oh, fuck no. <laughs> so he wore it with the Cranbrook tie, bunches of flowers, and there they were in the photo. Have a close look. Mungo immediately put daffodils behind his ears to match his shorty pyjamas. <laughs> Paul in his Cranbrook tie and floral suit holding hands together. As Cranbrook boys do, <laughs> don't they, Jenny? Paul said to me when he was dying, you know, I really want to be buried in my school tie in that floral suit. And I think, oh, I'll be happy to lay you out in that, darling. I always wanted to fucking burn it. <laughs> we had, and he did. And they not only shared Cranbrook, they've shared the same crem crematorium, haven't they, Jen, and the same undertaker? Oh, old boys to the end, they are. <laughs> we had many happy days together, and at Finn's in particular. Remember those days, those lazy Sunday afternoons, the big fish? I went to school with Steve Snow, carrying bar, Endeavour High. <laughs> so we matched. <laughs> we were there on one occasion when John Stubbs was f enthusiastically encouraging Mungo and Paul to argue that the demise of education in Australia was because they took Latin out of the curriculum <laughs> and they would flourish it with Latin words. At the end of the argument, quite boozy, both of the lads stood up and sang the Cran Book Anthem. <laughs> yes, in Latin. Well, Steve and I weren't going to have that, were we? I reported in, Steve and I came out, and we did Endeavour High School song. Apparently, private schools have anthems, publics, co-eds have songs. So we did Endeavour, Endeavour, a name carved out in history, Endeavour, Endeavour, our name had aim to be, and it just fueled the argument. <laughs> We had lots of days at St Mungo's and when Orlando was born, he was a little boy in the garden. And as you remember St Mungo's days, while well, all the adults were drinking and partying and smoking and the jazz was playing, the little four-year-old, uh, Orlando, was going busily about Mungo's garden, picking tiny tom tomatoes <laughs> off his plants and little chilies and collecting them. Mungo noticed this and in Mungo's style went straight over to him touched him on the shoulder, looked him in the eye and said, you take any more of my food from my garden without asking me, I bloody will wring your neck. <laughs> Little curly-haired Orlando looked at this giant and went, OK. And then that moment, I realised Mungo treated children as he did adults, <laughs> with honesty and frankness, and they knew the border. Orlando would go on to become a landscaper in a garden in their home and it was too much to Jenny and my delight towards the end in particular when they would go and buy natives and Orlando would come and plant mango, would get up out of his chair, go and sit in the garden, just instruct how it had to be and they had this similarity in knowing. But really I think it was the conditions of deployment were clearly outlined when he was four. <laughs> Touch anything I'll wring your bloody neck. One of the lazy days at Finn's long ago, as I said, I didn't drink and I was in charge of driving and looking after children. I had to go to the toilet, as women do at a lunch. And I said to Paul, can you just keep an eye on Orlando? And I went to Lou, came out, said hello to Steve again in the kitchen. When I got back, I said, where's Orlando? Oh, he was just here a minute ago. And you remember where Finn's was, surrounded by water in the mangroves. I went, what do you mean he was here? Orlando started calling and looking, calling. Hey, Orlando's missing. Can everybody just look for Orlando? He's missing. There's freaking water everywhere. So as a mother, I'm thinking he's definitely trapped in quicksand, which we don't know is here. You know, he's drowned. He's taken by the only shark that ever came up. My, you know how the women, you just go, what is happening? And it seemed like ages. And we're singing out, Orlando, Orlando, and we're going up and down and all around. And then it seemed like a really long time. I was getting to, do we ring the cops? And Mungo walks up, wet and muddy, 
with, with Orlando in his arms, a little boy of about eight, and maybe six, and Orlando's holding a crab, but Mungo's holding Orlando, and they both say, look what I found. <laughs> I went, oh, good on you, and that, for me, was challenging. How come Mungo McCountain, not known for his parenting skills and affiliation with children, <laughs> could find my kid? What about my mother's intuition? What about my psychic powers? Where did they go? Mungo's got the kid. You've got to be kidding. So I said to Mungo, quietly after everyone was calm and dried off, Mungo, how did you know where to find Orlando? And he said, I just thought, if I was a little boy at a function where everyone was getting pissed and eating and they were all adults and I was the only kid, where would I go to play? So I walked up there in the dense mangroves and there he was. <laughs> and in that moment, I realised that Mungo had that empathy for minorities, for little people, for the oppressed, the people without voice, the people who are homeless, the people, the refugees, that indigenous people. He could empathise, he had the compassion and he had the fight to be their voice to get justice, to fight for justice, to fight for honesty in politics and truth in politics. And he did it. His honesty was brutal. And that was something we shared. I don't think there's one person in this room who probably hasn't been offended or upset or insulted by Mungo confronting them and saying his truth. But I, what I learnt from Mungo, we share that, what I learnt from Mungo was... It's my responsibility to be honest. It's not my responsibility to be responsible for people's reaction to my honesty. And that was a really important thing for me, particularly as Mungo was losing his abilities and preparing to die. And the only way we could do it was to be fully honest. Do you want that? No. I used to cook. We used to enjoy cooking together a lot. He used, I, I'm not, he didn't like cooking desserts. I don't like eating them, but I don't like making them. So we used to make these things. And as the time went on, he got into, he would be honest. No, I don't like that. No, I'd try different things, especially with his condition as it changed. And he stuck, got stuck on cream caramel and bloody chocolate mousse. And that's all I made for the last few years for him. I'd try something and he'd go, no. And then soup and stews and things like that. But the night I asked him not to die on his birthday, I said, I'm not going to place on time on my birthday, which was the 10th. So it was really good that he accommodated me on the 9th. And I said to Jenny, what was his last meal? She said, I'll gazpacho and then some of your chocolate mousse. So the fact is, and Mungo wouldn't mind me saying this, my chocolate mousse is to die for. <laughs> I mean, other people say it. Other people say it. But that is a fact. <laughs> So we shared the loves, and Jenny and I became closer and closer, mainly because I slept in Mungo's part of the bed that he left when he got his illness and slept in the lounge room. I think she missed his snoring. <laughs> and we'd sneak off. I hate sport, he hated movies. We love movies. So if we were, we'd sneak off, oh, Mungo, we're so tired, we'd just go, we'd sneak on Vera and watch something else apart from sports, wouldn't we? And we were like schoolgirls, talking and talking. Well, we'll do a meditation now. Yeah, which one will we do? Yeah, we'll meditate now. Hey, then just before we start, <laughs> what do you think? And we were like schoolgirls on camp. And this went on and on, week after week after week. And we'd plan our next day. What if you do this? We would manipulate Mungo to do things that we thought were good for him, to get him out, to do stuff. And what happened, when Mungo started living life in the very slow lane, we discovered the little things in life were the big things for us. Seeing the osprey at the wall, watching the whales migrate from Lennox Headland, watching the dolphins at Ballina, having a cup of... Uh, soup or a, a coffee on the beach at Lennox, watching Mang, uh, Jenny feed the birds, watching the dogs rump, all these things, watching the garden grow, watching the flowers bloom, all these little things became the big things that we enjoy together and it enriched all of us in our lives. I like 
the fact that we're all here today celebrating Mungo's life in this venue. Because I'd like to not acknowledge he was banned from this venue. <laughs> and he'd like to know we're all here talking about him. <laughs> so I'm, I've, in, I've shared some of my stories with you. I should say, I went to St Mungo's, the cathedral. Have you ever been there? In Scotland. Here's a story. When we were over in Scotland, my name's Ramsey, okay, Lynn Ramsey. So when we were in Scotland, I said to Mungo, I'm going to go and look at it. So we went to the cathedral, which is vast and huge and goes for blocks and blocks and blocks and because of St Mungo. And we went to Even Song, and I thought, I've got to find St Mungo's grave so I can take a picture of it for Mungo. And then I said to the people there, could I possibly go and point out where St Mungo's grave is? This, I didn't know that Harry Potter film was there. I'm not a Harry Potter friend or fan, but it is massive, this cathedral. It goes to blocks and there's... I thought we'd see a grave outside somewhere. I'm not just sort of... Because it goes for hills. I thought, oh, if you go up that way, have a lovely walk. But no, the guy says, oh, no, no, no. No one can see St Mungo's grave. It's in the crypt. Oh, where's that? The bottom of the building. No, we don't let the public there. And I went, oh, what a shame come all the way from Australia, my friend Mungo McCallan, every year has a huge festival to celebrate St Mungo. On St Mungo's Day, we have a feast of St Mungo. He's been doing it for years. He didn't tell him it was a boozy drunk lunch. Oh, well, in that case, if you want to wait until everybody's gone, I'll personally escort you down. And I went, oh, that's pretty cool. So we wait till everyone leaves and Paul and I are there. I have claustrophobia badly. So he takes us down this, oh, 1400 and something, takes us down these stairs and stairs into the bowels of the church to see. And I'm getting claustrophobic. I think this is such a bad idea with just a torch. But I did it. And I came back with a trinket for Jenny, which was a brooch made of silver, for which St Mungo was celebrated and made a saint for. And on the brooch, it has a tree, a bird, a fish and a bell for the tree that never grows, for the fish that never swims, for the bird that never sings and for the bell that never tolls. And you can Google it and have a look at it, but it's all really interesting um, why Mungo was made a saint. We came home with great stories and photos for Mungo to enjoy. Even though he was an atheist, he really got into it. I've shared my stories today hoping that you will when we hear the boys play and have a drink and share our stories about each other, about our good, the bad and the ugly. Don't forget the ugly, because Mungo really liked people talking about his ugly side. So, and acknowledge it. And while we do that, I'm really hoping that we, this togetherness will spirit him away to places beyond what we can understand here. And he would be really pissed off being an atheist and me being a spiritualist actually saying that out loud. But I know, I know for a fact that Mungo believed in a force greater than himself. And that force was love. And we all loved him. And he loved us in so many ways. So I'd say share his love amongst us today. And thanks, Mungo, for the memories. Thanks, Lynn. Um, I'm pretty sure he liked Finn so much. Isn't there a photo of him yeah. stealing a fish? The, the sign. You'll see the photo. There's a big sign. Um, Mungo also accommodated me on my birthday. He waited till late in the afternoon before he finally flew away. Um, I had time to have my lunch. Uh, next, I would like to ask David Lovejoy to come and speak about uh, Mungo's years at the Echo. I first met, <clears throat> excuse me, I first met Mungo at one of the Echo Awards nights, either 88 or 89. The only thing I remember about that night was the Limerick contest for the prize of an extra bottle 
of the rather modest wine that we'd set out on all the guest tables, and Mungo won by rhyming echo with wine like the piss of a gecko. (laughs) I'm not sure if Mungo realised it, but that rhyme (coughs) led Nicholas Shand to christen the newspaper's cricket team, the Geckos. And Mungo was one of our players for a season or two, although he would probably have admitted that his brain understood the game better than his body did. (laughs) And at any rate, his cricket writing was, like everything he did, shrewd, informed and funny. And he generously shared the benefits of his eminence in that field with Nick and me when we went to a test at the Gabba and sat with him in the well-sighted and well-lubricated journalist's enclosure. In 1989, Munger became our star columnist. (coughs) Knowing that we couldn't pay properly, at least at first, he let us reprint stuff he'd already published in a Melbourne paper. The same principle later applied to his very popular crosswords. And then he hit on the idea of writing articles that would make some money from syndication and gave them to us first. When he started those columns at the beginning of his long association with the Echo, I don't think I fully realised what a national treasure he was. As a POM, my political education had been private eye rather than the Nation Review. But the quality of the weekly essay he delivered soon enlightened me. To achieve that quality so effortlessly was an indication of how deeply he understood the political world. Even though by moving up here, he'd left some of its tendrils behind. What Mungo had not left behind was his wit, and the art of making complicated events clear to his readers, along with the resting descriptions of the participants. Some of these could rival his university friend Clive James. For example, the diminutive figure of John Howard in the bush, wearing an Akubra hat and looking like a stray roofing nail. <laughs> And you you may have thought I was going to use Mungo's other famous description of Howard, the unflushable turd. (laughs) Images from digestion seem to arise naturally in politics. He wrote, Supping with one nation requires not just a long spoon, you need an army of food tasters and a stomach pump at the ready. (laughs) Speaking of stomachs, As we know, Munger was a master cook, and he wrote a hybrid memoir-come-recipe book full of reminiscences of restaurants and meals of all kinds. The book also allowed him to expound lyrically on his hatred for tofu. (laughs) Before the book appeared, I was hoping that exposure to the Bayern Shire ethos would moderate Munger's loathing for this inoffensive curd, just as he had moderated his traditional ALP dislike of the Greens, but it was not to be. So every week, for more than a generation, local readers have grabbed the echo and turned to the op-ed page to see how Mungo is dissecting the issue of the day and to chortle at his turns of phrase. I know he also created a huge non-echo body of work in that time, But Munger spent 31 years up here elevating the Echo's reputation while he was only 20 years in the Canberra Press Gallery. (laughs) At any rate, he seemed to fit us perfectly and the Echo must have been his longest continuous employer by some margin. I began by remembering Munger's facilities for limericks and it's true, bits of verse often crept into his columns. Many people have quoted the very last thing he published online when he announced that he could no longer write, and it was typically a four-letter farewell in rhyme to Scott Morrison. Munger's more measured estimate of our chief of marketing came in an echo column earlier this year. 
He wrote categorically, I have watched 30 prime ministers since Menzies and I have never seen one so inadequate. It's a stringent judgment, but it's not malicious. His writing was almost always good humour. Mockery was more to his taste than the blind hatred between opposing tribes that seems to constitute much of our current political discourse. I felt the gentleness that lay behind Mungo's sometimes rough exterior when, years ago, over a bottle or six with Nick, we were exchanging our favourite Shakespeare lines. His was from a song in the play, Cymbeline. Fear no more the heat of the sun, nor the furious winter's rages. Thou thy worldly task hast done, home art gone, and tain thy wages. Golden lads and girls all must, as chimney sweepers come to dust. There were among us. Thank you, David. I would have loved to have been there to hear that exchange of Shakespearean lines. I think um, the idea of a national treasure, I think we could work on that. Has someone got a line to ScoMo? Maybe we could have him confer that. <laughs> you never know. So I think now some of the members of Mungo's family would like to come up and have a chat. Okay, so we're just reading out some things from various people in, in Mungo's life. And the first one is from his stepson, uh, Richard Barrett. <clears throat> Mungo, I'm eternally grateful for having you as my stepfather during my formative years. Not only were you engaged, loving and supportive, but you stimulated my intellect in a way that, could, that very few could. And I believe I'm a far better person than I would have been without your tutelage. Thank you, Richard Barrett. This one's from Will Stubbs, who's a great family friend and son of John and Mary he Stubbs. <coughs> John and Romy Stubbs, sorry. Mungo was a true friend to our parents. He dedicated one of his many books to John and Romy, last of the true believers. But he was a true believer too, a believer in truth, truth that doesn't require belief, and he served that one master up until the day he died, without fear or cowardice and usually at great cost to himself. As a 13-year-old in the ashes of the dismissal, locked in a holiday rental in surface through a two-week tropical low, Mungo, the maths graduate, and I played mastermind, the game with the different coloured pegs. He beat me over a hundred times with no allowance for my age. <laughs> and in doing so, taught me the beauty of truth. Susie, Sash and I, and then our own kids, all grew up with Mungo as an exciting, loving presence in our lives, and we will always love him. Will, Susie, Sash, Miriki, Jamie, Rosie, Azza, Audrey, Jude, Darcy and Sienna. This one's from Chris Feek, publisher of Black Ink and Mungo's editor for many years. For many years we were honoured to publish his work. Mungo was emotional but not sentimental, sceptical but never cynical. He brought wit to the coverage of Australian politics and thus permanently expanded our sense of it. Mungo would recall sitting with Gough Whitlam on the night of his election, making use of his Sydney University maths degree to determine the moment of victory. In the years to follow, he was irreverent, acerbic and unfaithfully truthful. He never missed a deadline. His work remains. Chris Fick. From the family, we would like to thank the Byron, the Byron Shire community for welcoming Mum and Mungo when they first moved here more than 30 years ago. That welcome and support has continued throughout the years to become a relationship of love and respect with so many people contributing to what has become an exceptional, exceptional life and now an exceptional farewell for Mungo and a supportive and loving network for Mum. So thank you. I'm the last one, I promise, and I can picture him up the back doing this, so I'm <laughs> going to be quick. Um, in spite of all the nice things people have been saying, 
Our father, the father of us four daughters, wasn't all that complex. Give him a beer, or as we all know, several beers, a swim in the ocean, a word puzzle, an opportunity to denounce idiocy as defined by him, not you, you drongo, a pot bubbling on the stove, wafting the aromas of his latest concoction through the house, sport, any sport, always sport, on the TV, a gentle lick on the hand, someone to argue with and colourfully insult as required. But most of all, Mungo, a.k.a. Dad, a.k.a. Beardy, was a hopeful man. I understand this isn't the picture that comes to mind for those who enjoyed him, and particularly those who match him to the gloomy character in the cartoon who has finally heard the terrible news. But the joke's on them. He was that most endangered of creatures, a man who still believed that politics was an honourable calling and expected politicians to keep that promise. A man who believed in better days and raged when people let that belief down. Things that made him smile. His family. The mighty Canberra Raiders league team. A perfect pun. Any art. His extremely charming and well-behaved dogs. Other people's less well-behaved dogs. <laughs> Taking his granddaughter on a drug run to Nimbin. <laughs> Putting someone right. Any nursery, any garden, in any geographic location, at any time. Body surfing the perfect wave. As he always said, if God had meant us to use surfboards, we'd have been born with fiberglass feet. <laughs> Making a three-day bouillabaisse and a dining table circled by people enjoying his bouillabaisse. Bowling someone out with a finely judged spin ball. I know it seems unlikely, doesn't it? But it really was the case. Um, the perfect put-down sport. Daily beating everyone to the nine-letter word. And when someone got the nine-letter word before him, and of course, Jenny, a.k.a. Mum, a.k.a. Nana. Things that made him rage. The mighty Canberra Raiders League team. <laughs> Cynicism. People who failed to live up to his hopes. Slow service. Lazy statements and postmodern jargon. Drongos. Poltroons. The death of treasured friends. Bad drivers. People who talk for too long, otherwise known as longer than he was interested. <laughs> too much traffic in Mullumbimby. And apparently camembert just out of the fridge. <laughs> Things that made him weep. The mighty Canberra Raiders League team. <laughs> Anyone doing something brave. Wine. Shakespeare, the Iliad and all poetry all the time. Our country repeatedly letting down its traditional owners and every single hard-fought Indigenous win. His family and hope. I fear we may all have succumbed to some of that. Certainly our family's sketchy knowledge of anatomy allowed room for Mungo's seeming perpetual motion machine, one that combined rage, impatience, humour and a lightning-fast wit to create for us a lifelong regular commentary that made this mad, bad world feel a little smarter, a little funnier and a little better than we feared it was. A lot of people have talked about Jenny's extraordinary commitment to Dad in his time of need and have noted how lovingly she cared for him in these last sick and largely silent years. But we four daughters and granddaughters and grandson know this isn't true. Mungo's needed Jenny for decades, more than 35 years, to love him, to support him, to protect innocent offenders from his wrath, and most importantly, to sustain hope so that he could sustain ours. Thank you, Gillian and Adrian and Gail and Diana. It's, you're very brave. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, the family would like to thank everybody for coming to celebrate with Mungo. Um, on a personal note, I'm really honoured to be asked to be here today. I'm honoured to be here amongst all of you. Uh, we know many of you have stories and thoughts about Mungo that you'd like to share. Um, scattered around there are some note cards and pens uh, and some more supplies up near the refreshment table uh, and against the back wall. So if you would like to uh, put something there, the family would love to read your stories and please share a thought or 
a word or two and, and stick them on the board up at the back. So that's the end of our, I suppose, official meeting today. There's a bit of housekeeping because of the current health situation. Uh, before we end this stage of the proceedings and gather to greet old friends and meet new ones, if you're inside, the requirements are that you uh, can get a sanger, but then you have to sit down. Uh, you can't stand and gather around as if you're at the non-members pub and having a little drink. After we finish, the staff will rearrange this area so you can sit in something that's a little bit more conducive to chatting. Um, on the outside deck, you are welcome to stand and mingle, um, but again, you need to be aware that the amount of people out there, the maximum is 45. So enjoy the rest of the afternoon, have a good laugh, have a good cry, and thank you all for coming. And we'd like to say goodbye to all the people who are, who are watching online at the moment. The what? Oh, oh, there's going to be music. Oh, there's going to be stuff. The Unity Jazz Band. The Unity Jazz Band, which is, isn't in my notes, but I should have psychically known that. Um, the Unity Jazz Band are going to play, and then there's going to be an awesome slideshow here that David's prepared um, with lots of photos and some videos and things like that. So please do stay and, and have, a, have a cup of tea. Um, if you, you all know where the bar is. You don't need me to tell you that. So, uh, And thank you for coming.